This is Anthony Anarino, and you're listening to In the Arena. Step into the arena. My friend Dave Brock introduced me to Jack Malcolm. Jack is the president of Falcon Performance Group, where he trains salespeople. His focus is the complex sale, but Jack weaves military history, behavioral economics, and cognitive psychology into a powerful approach that helps people gain the ability to influence and persuade others. Jack is also a public speaker, and we caught up between my trip to Australia and his trip to China. I asked Jack to share his best ideas about how you can give better presentations, how you can tell stories and use them like handles, and how you can open bigger. Here's my friend Jack Malcolm. Hey, Jack. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Anthony? I'm wonderful. Thanks for being here. So let's talk for a few minutes about your book, Strategic Sales Presentations. And I want to start you with a question related to the book, but not in the book. And then I'll ask you a few questions based on your work. So recently, a salesperson that I know went into a boardroom to make a presentation. And as he pulled out his laptop and began to set it up, a senior executive in the room said, if you turn on that PowerPoint, I'm throwing you out of this room. And the senior executive meant it. I mean, he literally meant it. So the sales rep shut the laptop lid and put the computer away, knowing that that was going to be the end of the discussion. So I know mm-hmm. about death by PowerPoint. I've been both a victim, you know, and the assailant at different times uh, in my life when it comes to death by PowerPoint. But I think that that executive, you know, telling him that if you turn on PowerPoint at all, I'm going to throw you out, sums up this idea that when we're in this situation where we're presenting our ideas, we're not creating enough value for our audience, for the people that are sitting there going through that. So I think I just set you up nicely for the first point in your book with a a story you can probably relate to. Well, I I can definitely relate to that. And and actually, if he had read my book, he never would have even run into that problem. Not because I'm against PowerPoint. I actually think it's not the it's not the tool that's at fault. It's it's how you use it. And we can talk about that later. But first of all, before you go into a major sales presentation, one of the reasons I call it strategic is you should have already done all the work and shaping the conditions for success before you got there. So he should have known that before you got in there. If I'm going to present to somebody and it's going to be a very important presentation for me and for that person, I'm not going to go in there blind if I can help it. I'm going to weave it in as part of my strategic sales process, which, as you well know, involves not just having one champion or one coach, but having as as, as many as you can, asking the right questions and having the expectations clearly set before you get there. In fact, I like to say that if you haven't won before you got there, then you may be in trouble. I agree with you completely on a couple points there. The first one, PowerPoint, in my mind, is still a great and effective tool. I love Mm -hmm. it. A lot of people love it. It's perfect for conveying ideas and having a conversation around those ideas. So I get it that we can abuse it and use it wrong, but it's still a good choice. I also agree with you completely. You shape the battlefield before you ever show up there, not to run us down the military track, which you and I could easily run down together. But I think that that's right. You should have known what the expectation was and set the expectation. I've personally been involved in sales where I walked down and I've been asked not to present. And then I got a list of 18 questions that were included in my presentation had I been allowed to turn on the slides. But a dialogue's fine with me too. I'm cool with that either way. Um, And I was prepared for the dialogue. I, 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 you know, and I also say, Anthony, it, whenever I train people, I say, look, put put together the best presentation. If you're going to use PowerPoint, go ahead and do it. But you should practice it at least one time without slides. You should you should know your presentation so well that you should anticipate that Murphy's law is going to be there. Mr. Murphy will be there or Colonel Murphy or whoever it is is going to be there when you show up. And if, if you if you can do a, it sounds like the, the 
salesperson you talked about was able to pull it off. So that, that's the good news is you should be able to do it without PowerPoint, regardless of whether you had the presentation or not. Except I think that you have a couple different categories of salespeople, new and young, inexperienced. They may not have the chops or right. there are a lot of situational knowledge. It's easier for them to wing it and riff, riff on things. Although I, I read your book, so I know you're not a big fan of winging it. No, <laughs> I'm with you on that side. I, I don't take issue with anything that you've written in the book, um, but there's one area I just want to hear you talk about a little bit more. And so it's my experience that decisions are more and more being made by consensus. And mm-hmm. I write a lot about how you have to think about all the different stakeholders. And I think you do a really nice job of laying out sort of a stakeholder map and a stakeholder analysis of who's who and what they want. And then you close the chapter with a really solid advice on presenting to senior executives and meeting their needs. So I've had a lot of experience with senior executives in the room, and they've looked at, at key stakeholders to really be the decision maker for them. Mm-hmm. So they're really looking to that, even though in my experience, sometimes that's a relatively low level person on an org chart, or when you look right. at formal authority versus the informal authority that they really have. So it feels to me like there's this conflict in the room when you walk into a room and there's 14 or 18 stakeholders and I've got senior executives there and they want the big picture. They want to talk about owning the strategic outcomes, revenue, profit, those kinds of ideas. And then you got stakeholders who are lower level, who are big time influencers, and they're concerned with the particulars about how is your solution going to work for me? And I'm the one that's actually going to be touching it. And the senior manager who's in the room is never going to be a part of this after today. What's your right. advice on managing that when you have different levels of stakeholder all together? And I know you want to talk about winning before the deal, but what do you do in that room to meet all their needs? Okay. And, and I do want to stress, I, I don't want to be repetitive, but again, talking to people, assuaging their concerns before you go in there and having a real clear understanding of what the actual agenda is for that presentation. And, and when I use the word agenda, that's probably too broad a term. What is, what is the key point that you want to get across? A lot of it has to do on what's the decision to be made. If it's, going, if it's a decision that says, we, we already know we want to do something, but we want to decide between A and B, and that decision will be based on the technical merits, then that's one thing. If it's a decision that says we're going to do something that's going to fundamentally change the way we do business. And yes, technology is a very important decision there, but it's it's mainly a a hygienic factor, if you will. And what I mean by that is we've got to be able to make sure the technology works. But the higher level person is the one who's going to make that decision as to whether they're going to change the way they do business. So you have to really look at, at so many different things. It has to do with what is the decision that, that needs to be made? How much do people already know about the entire issue or problem to be solved, et cetera? So that's that's kind of a, a probably long-winded way of saying that it, it, it truly depends. And again, it goes back to being strategic. Too many people go into a presentation with a one-size-fits-all mentality. They said, let me tell you about how great my product is. Well, you know, lots of products are great, but they may not be great for those stakeholders at that particular time. I've split these up in the past. I've split them up and said, you know, I want to present to you and your team first Mm -hmm. uh, before we bring them in because I want to make sure I meet your needs and and done it as what I've I've sort of called a pre-proposal. Mm-hmm. So, so that they would get it and have a chance to to beat it up. And then when I carried in the bigger points, they had already felt like they got what they needed. You know, that, that reminds <laughs> me, there was an article that was written probably about 20 years ago by Steve Bistritz. And it, it basically showed a U-shaped curve for major, major decisions in, in businesses. U-shaped in a sense that If you wanted to get somebody to say, yeah, this is a good idea, we should explore it and we should devote resources to analyzing this, you need people at a high level to sponsor that. But then all of the analysis and all of the gathering of information, Mm -hmm. the U goes down and they've got lower level people doing that. But then when it comes time to pull the trigger on that decision, that's the 18 stakeholders in the room who are going to make that that decision. So once again, that does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs as part of your sales process. So you have to know, you have to fit the actual type of presentation to to where you are in the process and to who the people are in a room as a result. 
I want to see that article sometime. You're going to have to point it uh, to me. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I like that. Because I wrote a post the other day um, about selling to the A, B, and F suite. And I think that what's yep. what's interesting about that U-shaped, and we're, of course we're going to get dragged into the military mm-hmm. ideas, but it's the ground truth. I mean, the, the senior executive can sponsor it, but they're not close enough to it to really give you the information and the facts and yep. the analysis and the real constraints. And they don't really want to know. They, they mm-hmm. want somebody else to, to deal with their part of this, and then you can bring it back to me when it's done and help me make a good decision. Exactly. I think that's where we're at today in decision-making for sure. It seems like a lot of the work's being done at the ground truth level, but then you're still going to need executive sponsorship to get anything signed now. Right. But but you've got to do both. I I was I was kind of raised by by in, in sales by the, the idea of you go to the top mm-hmm. and and, and and I've done that and it's worked for me, but at the same time, it, it's also backfired on me on several occasions. And you've I've I've learned that yes, you go to the top, but you better have those those alliances, you better have those relationships and that trust built at the the lower levels as well, because they're the ones that are going to make or break the success of whatever you try to implement. Yeah, I was taught uh, start with authority, but authorities change so much now. I think the right answer. For most salespeople is get in wherever you can get in, but know who you need. So if right. you have to come in low, don't believe you're going to get there without authority. And if you have to come in high, don't believe you're going to get in there without collecting all the stakeholders at lower levels because you're not. And I think that's the real reality now, at least as I mm-hmm. as I experience it. Yeah. So I know that sales organizations, I, I one in particular it seems like they get about 90 minutes for a full presentation for questions and answers in a boardroom situation. And I know one particular organization with a 96 slide deck. So hmm. you've got literally more than one slide per minute in a room. Yeah. And I, I always chuckle at that idea that you can get through that much content because you can't. But I think that more is really less when it comes to presenting and less is really more. And that if you decide that you have to present everything about your company, the founder's name, what you were, you were founded, every location on your map, you really end up presenting nothing. How do you choose what message you want to give when you're sitting in the boardroom, when you've got that chance to, to deliver that presentation? It, it goes back to what I say in the book. Again, deciding exactly what is your purpose for that presentation, number one, and then figuring out what is their value that they will get out of that presentation, putting that together into a key theme. And that theme is then going to determine how everything else is built. Usually the theme has very little to do with the idea, is your company big enough or financially sound enough or had been in business long enough to, to do work with us, because guess what? You probably wouldn't even be in that room to begin with if you hadn't already crossed over those. I think what happens with a lot of those presentations is that the more that other people want to get involved in it. I was just reading an article about how speech writers for the president address have to talk to about 80 different people, all of whom want something to put in there. Yeah. So uh, it there there's a fine balance. You you talked about the experience of the salesperson. I'm always on the side of the salesperson. So I like to say, if you don't control the presentation, then then why are you even there? Having said that, if you've got a fairly inexperienced salesperson, I can understand why other people would want to be involved to make sure that this part of the message gets in and that part of the message gets in. But I think people build a presentation the wrong way. They take all that information and then say, okay, now what can we include during the 90 minutes? And it, it's nothing, it, it, the, the, way, the way that I say it is start with the core message. What is it that you want them to get out of it? Because think, think, how many presentations have you sat through in your career? Thousands probably, right? How many of those do you actually remember? If somebody said a week ago you sat in a presentation, what was it about? You're going to remember probably about half a paragraph worth of information on that. You better be very clear on what that half a paragraph is and then build from there. The very best presentations that I've been a part of on either side as the salesperson, the slide deck was ancillary to the conversation. So really, we knew what we needed to accomplish together around the table about deciding to move forward together or not. And then the deck just served that purpose. So we knew what our message was and we knew what our message was together because I think it's really, you know, it's 
I agree with your philosophy. I should have already won by the time I get to that table. So we're really making that final decision together. And this is sort of our last conversation about that. And I asked you that question. Um, yeah. I set you up because I did read the book and I wanted you to answer that for people listening. So they get the benefit of knowing you need to think deeply about that outcome. What are they supposed to be getting out of this and what are we helping them decide? So you compare that 96 slides down. Maybe it's 12 uh, right. that you need for a 90 minute conversation. Or you may need 96 slides, but you, you start out with 12 and then when the questions come up. Yeah. That's how I well, build my yeah, decks. A slide on that. Let me go, go to that. And, and in fact, I, I I think sometimes that gives you better credibility. It, it almost seems like you're not trying to cram everything in. You're giving them just enough information. It's again, and I don't want to use a military term, but the whole need to know basis. Yeah. But not this is what do they need to know to make that that decision that day? Now, some of them will have some other questions you may not have anticipated or something that is very personal to them. They might ask something about that. And then you can decide based on the time you can say, OK, well, actually, I cover that. Let's let me jump right to it. And then again, the better you know the presentation, there's even ways in PowerPoint that you can actually put in the, the number of the slide. If, if you know it that well, that's really impressive. That's pretty hard to do. But if you press in number 47 and it jumps right to that slide, you'll blow people away. I build every deck with a menu on the front with just buttons that take you to the slide. And then I use a logo on every mm -hmm. deck to take me back to the menu. So it's two clicks to get wherever I need to go. Yeah, that's and great and I bury everything in that uh, in that sort of ancillary deck that you're talking about. So you need it. You've got it. You don't need it. You don't pull it out. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest gaps that I've seen, um, especially people who have presented to me, there's a lot of ideas exchanged and a lot of we can, we do, we're this, we're that. But there's not a lot of proof being provided. And I'm seeing more and more. I think that in these presentations, what clients are expecting, and I think I'm expecting in a lot of ways, is some support of the main arguments that I'm making. What do mm -hmm. you think the most compelling way to provide proof is or what are some of the compelling ways that you can put proof into a presentation and make it interesting? Well, I I have a, a chapter on what kinds of evidence to use. And, and I, I if I recall correctly, I list them in descending order of proofiness, if you will. Obviously, probably the the best proof is is data that that has been collected from a reliable source. And if you can if you can put some of that in your presentation, that's pretty hard for people to to argue against. Second, almost as reliable, sometimes even more, depending on who you're presenting to, is actual eyewitness testimony. If you can say that you've been there, you've seen this and nobody else in the room has, it's pretty hard for anybody to argue with that. Going down, you've you've got less and less if you will, proofy types of evidence, but you also have more compelling types of evidence. If all you have is data and statistics, you're going to put people to sleep. The The problem is, and, and this is one of the areas where I've gotten into some online disputes with people, is the, the, the big rage right now is telling, telling stories. People think that stories substitute for data. And with high level people, that's that's not going to fly. Stories help, especially if you can tell the story around the data. Yep. But I don't think the story by itself works. You say this to me as I'm editing my first book, and I've got a bunch of stories in it, and I'm, I'm, it's a recipe book to begin with. So I'm thinking about how many stories are right, because I do think we get burnout out on stories, yeah. especially yeah. you know, as a sales guy. Some of the stories are my sales experiences, and I, I, I find my own stories. I'm going, wait a second, how many of these do I need to provide that proof? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it, there is something to that. We, it is useful in some cases, but less useful in others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stories are great. Content. They're great. Uh, they're great handles. You know, if, if you've right. got a, a key idea, the, the story is a handle. Um, and what I mean by that is that if people in that room go out and repeat your story to other people who are in the decision process who may not have been there, then you've won. So absolutely, uh, stories are great, but they're no substitute for data. You, you've got to have both. It's kind of like, you know, people say, uh, yeah, not that anybody would ask this stupid question, but which leg is better for walking, the left leg or the right leg? You need them both. <laughs> True. So one more question, and this one's just a pure style question. Um, why is it that we want to wade into presentations? 
And I, I always see salespeople and they think they have to be so rigid and professional and stiff and they can't be loose at all. Instead of in opening with you know, some big theme or idea, they sort of tiptoe quietly in. I'm John and I brought Bob and I brought Sue and they go through this this whole thing. And then they just wade into the first slide and there's no sort of line of demarcation where the beginning of the presentation has started. How do you do something bigger and better than that? And let me ask you a two-parter. How do you get comfortable opening big? Okay. I I like to open big and and, and I don't like to start by saying, hi, I'm Jack and, and I'm from Falcon Performance. First of all, I'm on the agenda. They know who I am. Most people, when when they start out, they what do they say? Hi, my name is so and so, and I'm glad to be here, and blah 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 blah. It's kind of like the 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 boilerplate that goes on at the end of a a car commercial that you hear on the radio. People tune out, and when when people are sitting there, you're getting up to present. What's going through their mind? They're probably looking at their cell phone to to figure out uh, if there's an email they need to look at. They're thinking about what the last person said. Their their attention is is not at a peak. So what you've got to do is break the pattern a little bit. And a simple way to break the pattern, you, you, you don't want to get real hokey or you don't want to be real crazy with it. But I get up there and I just start talking. And then I might maybe 30 seconds into it, a minute into it, say, hi, my name is Jack Malcolm and, and I'm glad to be here. But I start talking and I deliver my value proposition for that specific presentation right then. Or I say something, I ask them a question, something that is going to get their attention and get them thinking. But I want to get them engaged as much as possible. And once I get them engaged, then I can start getting into the body of the presentation. That first 30 seconds is is very valuable real estate. Let me ask a follow-up question on that. So there's a bit of showmanship to presenting that way, isn't there? There is. There is. And and the again, you you have a a balancing act that you need to follow. If you if you don't do any showmanship. If you don't break the pattern a little bit, you're probably not going to make much of an impression on people. If you try a little bit too hard, I tell people that if you're pre preparing the presentation the night before, what sounds good at 10 o'clock the night before <laughs> doesn't always work well in the light of day. So you may want to try it out on somebody in your office. Say, what do you think of this? So there, there is a fine line there, but sometimes you've got to be a little bold to be noticed, to be a little different. I, I think that's good advice. I recommend Toastmasters. Um, Toastmasters, you know, is where I learned to open big, and we never let anybody wade into any kind of a presentation there. And it sort of changes fundamentally how you do these things. Right. Right. Hey, Jack, I want to I want to say something nice about you while you're still on the phone, so you're listening to me say this. So anybody listening to this, buy Jack's book, Strategic Sales Presentations. He's a super smart guy. And he's got really, really rock solid advice that's easy to follow. It's a bigger book than I would have thought it was when you when you asked me to look at it. It's um, it's I think close to 300 pages. It is. It's a big book, but it, it doesn't read like a big book. And every bit of it is actionable. So it's something that's really, really useful. What's the name of your other book? Bottom Line Selling. And Bottom Line Selling is a business acumen book, isn't it? Bottom line selling is a business and financial acumen book. Yeah. Just to put it into context, before I got into quote unquote sales, I was a commercial banker for 10 years and I had a degree in finance. And when I got into B2B selling outside of it was B2B selling, but when I got into it and then got into sales training, I found that very few people truly understood just the basics of understanding your customer's financial statement, understanding the business, using the right terminology, and using it to speak the language of high-level decision makers. I think you're right. It's a very important skill set to adopt right now. Business acumen, I think, is a new sales acumen. Being able to speak the language of business really matters for salespeople now. Absolutely. Jack, how do people find you? You've got a blog, and uh, tell me what's the best way for people to reach out to you. Easiest way is just remember my name, Jack Malcolm, and Malcolm is spelled M-A-L-C-O-L-M. 
So some some people misspell that. Just remember Malcolm X. There's two L's in it. So just jackmalcolm.com. You can reach me, and uh, that's my Skype handle. That's my Twitter handle. So it's it's pretty easy to do. Thanks so much for your time, Jack. Thank you, Anthony, and thanks for the great questions. I hope that gives you some ideas of how you can improve your presentations. Run out to Amazon.com and pick up Strategic Sales Presentations by Jack Malcolm. Visit him on the web at jackmalcolm.com. You can find me at thesalesblog.com. Do sign up for my newsletter when you get there, and I'll see you next week in the arena.